Workplace diversity has been in vogue for some time, but many companies are still struggling to define what it means for their organization, why it is important, and how to include it in their talent management strategy. It's well known that people with a diversity of identities, backgrounds, and circumstances bring with them different perspectives which can challenge groupthink and lead to innovative ideas. In our social newscast with me, Sam Marshall, we have a chat to Rude Ali, who is the Managing Director of Sergo, an international business process outsourcer, specialist in the contact center industry and HR consulting services. Rude, thank you very much for your time. Let's talk about diversity and inclusion in the workplace, especially in a country like South Africa where the unemployment numbers are incredibly high. The recent stats is absolutely shocking. How do you reflect yes. on diversity and inclusion? You know, Sam, with um, unemployment at an all-time high, South Africa's unemployment rate being at 32.6%, up from last year's 32.5%, and youth unemployment sitting at 74.4%. I think now more than ever, cultivating a workplace and having adequate representation is important, specifically focused on youth employment. I don't think that corporates actually realize how a diverse culture positively affects the working environment. We're looking at financial returns, overall, overall business strategy, and the opinions of people outside of their organizations. You know, equitable employers far outpace their competitors as diverse and inclusive workplaces earn deeper trust and more commitment from their employees. And it is a great time to highlight diversity in the workplace and in youth month with a spotlight on LGBTQI+. Because our country is a far cry from ensuring diversity in the workplace or to make it a real priority. And I hope by having these conversations, we may just make a difference. Now, obviously, this conversation around diversity and inclusion can't be removed from what you've done internally in your own business. Just talk to me about starting a business and then identifying and prioritizing (laughs) young people that come from diverse backgrounds and wanting to include them into a formal space. You know, as a woman and a, and a member of the LGBTQI plus community, I realized very early on in my career that the world of work wasn't really such a friendly and diverse place to be. So that having been in human resources and recruitment in the business process outsourcing sector in call centers specifically, I became intimately familiar with workplace bias and, and the obstacles that marginalized groups face on a day-to-day basis. You know, so with the private sector still embracing our data policies and procedures, it, it became a battle to fight the system from within. And, and I felt compelled to make it my life's mission to create a working environment that is empowering and welcoming to all. You know, so with over 190 employees, I've managed to build a very diverse work from home business solution. And so that forms part of the global business sector as a business process outsourcer specializing as a contact center and actual consulting services, servicing South Africa, North Africa, Southeast Asia, and Europe. And we're very fortunate to be servicing the globe from sunny South Africa. When we're looking at our employment statistics, about um, 83% of our workforce workforce is, is youth and 68% female and 87% make up employment equity hires. Um, so I think that um, we've, we've been very successful at creating a, a very diverse workforce for Serba. The other big thing, um, Rude, that probably sits center to all of this is the strategy that looks at talent. Um, Yes. How do you, and what is your advice for developing a cohesive, well-thought-out, progressive talent management strategy? You know, I think there are a few key factors you need to consider when creating a talent management strategy for diversity and inclusion. I think number one is establishing a sense of belonging for everyone. You know, having a connection to an organization or group of people that make you feel that you can be yourself not only results in greater engagement and creativity in the workplace, but it's also a psychological need as well. Empathetic leadership is key. Diversity and inclusion are often treated as as a single initiative owned exclusively by HR. But, you know, for real change to happen, every individual leader needs to buy into the value of belonging both intellectually and emotionally. And hiring goals, for example, cannot just be numbers on a spreadsheet. Hiring goals may boost diversity numbers, but this won't automatically create an inclusive culture. You know, too often leaders focus diversity and inclusion efforts disproportionately on the employee pipeline, but the employee experience continues far beyond an offer letter. 
And it's also important to, to maximize joy and connection and minimize fear when looking at a strategy. You know, people are wired to react with fear and distrust when their beliefs are challenged. While fear can be a powerful motivator, it also encourages people to narrow their perspectives, which is the opposite desired effect for creating a more inclusive workplace. And then lastly, consider your brand. As with any transformation effort, brands and culture are intimately connected. The products and services you put into the world reflect your value, values and then also ultimately your biases as well. In the journey towards building a more inclusive organization, it's important to consider the relationship between what's happening inside and outside of your company. What is your brand saying about who you are as a culture? You can hear that you've thought a lot about this as a, as a leader within your structure and as an organization in the direction you want to pivot to. But we did start off this conversation at the beginning talking about the LGBTQ community and how we create work environments for, for that particular group. I'm also cognizant of the fact that we are talking in youth month where um, LGBTQ plus youth in the workspace gets swallowed up by the political talk. Youth unemployment, the typical jargon you hear year on year. Why did you, yes. Sergo, want to focus specifically on LGBTQ communities? You know, I think that um, violence, with violence and brutalization against women, children and people from the LGBTQI plus community, I think that we still have a very far way to go to raise awareness and affect change and create safe and inclusive working environments. You know, I think that, well, this month, for example, we, we mark 45 years since the student uprising of 1976. And it's important to celebrate those who carry their legacy and principles of selflessness, determination and devotion that are necessary for success and growth for any society or nation. And I think that I would like to take this opportunity to reflect on the women, youth and diverse people of this great nation and to reflect on how far we have come and how much we have achieved. But the race is not over yet, but we still have much work to do. And having said that, specifically focusing on the LGBTQI plus community, I think that it's still a conversation that that is considered as taboo um, because I think that people are still very fearful of these types of groups in the workplace, turning a blind eye in terms of the violence and discrimination that's actually work happening in the world of work. And I think that it's important to have a spotlight on this and specifically for the youth of this nation because our youth make up a large portion of this community as well, or of the LGBTQI plus community. So I think that it is, you know, earlier on this week, I had an opportunity to, have, to speak on a, on a radio station about the LGBTQ plus community and I was specifically asked to exclude this conversation from um, the discussion points. And, you know, I was actually at that point, I was shocked because I thought, why in this day and age are we still censoring these types of conversations? And I think it's by having these courageous conversations and not shying away from difficult topics and stepping into the proverbial pain that continue and with continuous education that we can make change happen. From your experience and the work that you're doing across the continent um, globally as well, are boardrooms becoming brave enough to talk about diversity and inclusion from an LGBTQ plus perspective? I think it's a blended it's a blended answer. I think yes and no. Been in boardrooms where the conversation is a discussion, um, and it, everybody is open to the conversation, but you still have groups and generations in the workplace, for example, that aren't necessarily open to the conversation. It's still a taboo and a very difficult subject in terms of, of LGBTQI+. Plus. It's almost like saying, I don't necessarily have a problem with that person doing that thing, but I don't want them to be in my environment or in my space because I don't necessarily want to, to be part of that. I'm not discriminatory, but, you know, so I think that it's a blended thing. It depends also on what type of environments and what companies. So it's a very difficult question to answer them. I think it's, it's, we still have a lot of work to, to do. And I think that it's still a taboo subject. And I still think that we are being censored in, in a lot of ways.